Good morning. Uh, my name is Kendra Sakamoto. I'm one of the librarians here at West Vancouver Memorial Library. Okay, I know that uh, we are all in different places this morning, but I would like to acknowledge that I am here today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish Nation, the tsleil Nation, and the Musqueam Nation. Um, for me, gardening is all about connecting with the land. Um, just yesterday, I was doing some gardening on the library's rooftop garden, Switeway Tamewak, and I just feel so incredibly grateful to work on this land that the Coast Salish peoples have been the careful caretakers of since time immemorial. Um, I personally strive to be a mindful steward of these lands and these waters and follow respectfully in the footsteps of those who have come before me. So today is the first in our Garden Talks series as we start to think about spring and the warmer weather. Um, it is sunny where I am, so that helps. And I'm so delighted today to welcome Arzina Hamir to talk about the critically important gardening piece, soil and compost. Um, Arzina works as an organic farmer and a local government politician. She has degrees in crop science and sustainable agriculture. She's worked internationally with small scale farmers all around the world and extensively across BC. She and her family run Amara Farm, a 25 acre certified organic farm in Courtney, BC. BC. And uh, welcome, Arzina. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, lovely to see you, Kendra, and um, have the opportunity to speak to gardeners about soils. So I'm going to share my screen. And yeah, so today we're going to be talking about soils. And, you know, it's often an overlooked um, part of gardening. And I have to admit, um, having done my degree in agriculture in the late 80s and early 90s, um, soils, were, I think, were often looked at as this inert um, medium that you just um, put seed and fertilizer in and things just grow and the soil is just there to kind of hold your plants. And we've learned just so much more about the importance of all of the components of soil and how having a healthy soil is really the foundation of growing healthy plants. Um, so I am, as Kendra mentioned, a certified organic grower. Um, my husband and I run Amara Farm in the unceded traditional territory of the Comox people on the east coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and when we moved here in 2012, you know, some of the things that we had to reckon with was a very different soil. Um, I have a very particular soil type. It's a, it's a loam, high levels of silt in my soil. And I was used to working in soils in Richmond, which are high clay. Um, and I know many of you who are tuning in are probably from the North Shore, where you may have more gravelly soils that are well draining. So we're going to talk today about all of the components of soil, both um, the physical and the non-physical, and then talk about how to maintain a healthy soil. So let's get at it. Um, and during the presentation, I'm going to take breaks um, just to check in and see um, if people have questions. So if a question arises, feel free to put it into the, um, the Q&A and Kendra will read it out and you know I'll be able to answer it at the time. So don't worry about trying to hold things until the very end. So just a little bit about me, as Kendra mentioned, I'm a certified organic grower. Um, we have a um, 26 acre vegetable and fruit farm. Um, of that, eight acres is in forest, which is incredibly important for the pollinators on our, in our um, farm. And we have two acres in vegetables and another three acres in mixed berry and nut crops. So I grow about 48 different types of fruits and vegetables from asparagus to zucchini and um, kind of everything in between. And um, for me, I love the part that I love about growing food is that it's both a science and an art. Um, we'll learn a little bit about the science. And then the art part is kind of like the programming of what we're going to grow this year and what it's going to look like and how, um, how we enhance the, the beauty of the farm. So that's the type of farming that I do. We are primarily um, doing most of our work by hand. We do have a little bit of, um, of tractor support when um, jobs are really big, but for the most part, we are mostly farming by hand which um, we'll talk about like what the benefits of that are. 
So <laughs> going back, um, what really is soil? Um, when you go out into your gardens and you see this brownish, maybe grayish material that's uh, in your in your yards, um, often we can get kind of carried away with like the, the physical, like what I see is this brown stuff, but what really is this material that's beneath our feet. Um, it's actually composed of um, four um, very distinct um, ingredients, I would call them. So we have the mineral component, you know, the physical um, aspect of soil. We have the organic matter, um, which is provides that um, carbon based um, support uh, for the soil. There is also the biology that's associated with that carbon area. So um, things that you can see like earthworms and maybe black beetles, um, and then the unseen, the microbiology, um, the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoas um, that are all uh, that we're learning are all incredibly important to helping to feed the plants that we wanna grow, but also just to be a healthy soil. And then let's not forget about the things that we don't see or the unseen, which are the air pockets. Um, air and oxygen are so incredibly important for growing healthy plants and maintaining a good garden. So I don't wanna forget that it's both the physical, the seen and the unseen that we need to maintain a really healthy soil. So when we talk about the mineral component of soil, um, often what soil scientists will do is when they take samples of soil, they will, um, first of all, sieve out anything that's big and chunky and gravelly. Uh, anything larger than um, two millimeters is generally taken out. Um, so the gravel component is, is extracted. And then um, they want to look at the components that are um, either sand, silt, or clay. Those are the three major types of soil particles that make up your soil texture. The sand, and if you can think of just a sandy beach, sand is actually the largest of the components. Um, it's got the biggest particle size. And um, some of the features of sandy, um, sand itself or very sandy soils is that they drain really well. Um, they allow, they don't hold mo moisture well, they allow for really good drainage. And if you have a very sandy soil, you can generally grow carrots really well and, and root vegetables that need that deep soil that doesn't have a lot of compaction. Sandy soils are very resistant to compaction. They're kind of like the springiest kind of soil that we have. Now, the next particle size down, the smaller size, um, is silt. Silt is generally um, found in areas that have rivers that flood and deposit this material called silt. And that's an area that I actually live in. Um, I live in a, um, a river delta. Portuguese Creek is just um, at, the, at the western edge of my property. And over the millennia, when beavers um, built dams in my area, the, the water would flood um, the, the, the land and deposit um, a very high percentage of silt. So my soil is made up of 40% of silt. Silt is a much finer um, particle size. So it's able to hold moisture um, quite well. Um, it still allows some drainage. So um, that's a, a great point, um, but it does absorb moisture uh, way better than sand does. And then lastly, we have a soil component of clay. Clay is the smallest particle size um, of the mineral component of soil. Um, clay particles are so um, tiny that they're, they're microscopic. You can't generally see them, um, an individual clay particle um, from the naked eye. Clay holds on to moisture incredibly well, in some cases almost too well. Um, but, but if you have a clay soil, you generally don't have to water as much as sil a silty soil and definitely not as much as a sandy soil. So those small, small particles means there is just a small amount of, of air pockets. And so the clay hangs on to moisture really, really well. 
Now, these are the three components of soil. Um, generally, nobody has 100% sand or 100% silt or 100% clay. It's a combination of these three. I'm going to pause there and just see if there are any questions, particularly about um, the mineral component of, of soil. Yeah, so just a reminder, you can enter any questions you have into the Q&A. So we do have one question. Um, how many inches does fresh air go into the soil? Ooh, um, I would say like in soils, um, uh, the way soil scientists look at your soil is in what's called horizons. There's layers of your soil. There's an A horizon at the very top, which is mostly made up of like all of the leaf material and the grass and has a lot of carbon. It's the, it's the, it's the layer that has the most um, interference with, with humans. Like we control that, that layer quite a lot. The B horizon um, has a mixture of some of like what earthworms bring down into the soil. So the A and B horizon both um, have a fairly high um, percentage of, of oxygen. And the depth of that really depends on how you manage your soil. Um, compaction is, is kind of the, the enemy of, of um, healthy soil. Um, and if you compact your soil, you generally are pressing all the air pockets out of it. And that's really hard for, for plants to grow in. It creates anaerobic or non-oxygen areas. Um, and that type of soil generally floods because the, the not only does air not come into the, the soil, but water has nowhere to go. So um, the depth of where oxygen comes into your soil really depends on how you manage it, um, I would say. In general, I would say probably eight eight inches, six to eight inches is what normally um, you find in kind of the urban environments. Uh, I would say in the prairies, in the grasslands where you have deeply rooted um, grasses, it, the air pockets that are formed because grass, um, grass roots kind of burrow deep into the, the soil and then die back, those can go down feet. And it's quite incredible. So it's really dependent on on the the type of soil, um, what grows there, and how it's managed. So I hope that answers that question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so how can I determine the mineral components of my soil? Oh, super. Yes. Okay. I have a. I think I have the next slide is going to answer just that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So there's two ways to do like to figure out what your soil texture is. And that's that's actually what we're talking about. The combination of clay and silt and sand is what makes up the texture of your soil. You can do that in a couple of ways. You can take a sample of your soil and send it to a soil lab and they will assess um, you know, through sieving um, methods the percentage of clay, silt and sand and give you that, um, to give you those numbers back. Now that obviously has a cost to it. Um, and while you're doing that, you probably will want to test for your nitrogen and your phosphorus and your other um, uh, for, you know, fertility, pH probably. So um, I highly do recommend if you, if you are really enjoying gardening and, and um, want to sort of know what's happening in your soil, that you do at least one soil test every few years, just to get an idea of what's happening. Now, obviously, you don't once your soil, once your texture is analyzed, you don't have to reanalyze that. That doesn't change. Um, however, if you want to just get a quick idea of what kind of soil texture you have, you can take a handful of your soil and you probably want to go down no more than six inches. And you can take samples from around your garden. Or if you know you've got like a really wet patch in the back or a really sandy patch in your front yard, take separate samples and place the water, place the soil in a jar and fill it up, shake it up, and then just allow it to naturally settle. Because what happens is the, the bigger particles, the sand particles settle almost immediately. Um, they're big and heavy. Uh, the silt layer, as you can see in, in the slide, can take a couple of hours to, to finally deposit. The clay layer 
can actually take a week plus sometimes to, to settle. Um, but when it does, it will give you like a visual um, percentage of, of what you have. So judging by this, this um, photo that I just grabbed off of the internet, I am looking at probably a 60% sand and then a 20% silt or yeah, or an, and then a 20% clay, about-ish, right? You're within five percentage and, and you, the clay looks a little bit more like maybe 25. So maybe 25 clay, 15 silt, and then the rest in sand. And that gives you an idea percentage wise of, of the makeup of that. So this is a really easy way you can do that with, with your kids. Um, it's a really nice visual way of figuring out what you have. Often what you'll also see floating in the, the top, which will never really settle, is the organic matter, like all the dark stuff. Um, that you don't have to worry about. That's not what's creating your soil texture, like the base soil texture. It's really the mineral component. So I hope that answers that. Any other questions on, on soil texture and the makeup of all of the, the, the bits of the, your soil? Yeah, so the last one here is, um, you know, how do you determine the mineral components in like retail soil bags and how does mm. that impact your plants and soil? Um, you mean, you can do the same test in, in whatever soil, you, you know, you come across. Um, the thing is, I generally don't see garden centers selling soil. They generally will sell compost or manure, bagged manure. Um, I, I still don't understand why people buy soil by like the mineral component. I know that happens here um, in the Comox Valley. People will just, people will buy soil primarily to fill their garden beds. If they're building raised beds and they need bulk material, just something cheap to fill a bed, that generally is what's called quote unquote topsoil, but is generally something that's scraped off of a construction site and sold to one of these soil providers. Um, if that's not what you're going for, if you are wanting to like maintain fertility in your in your garden, you will not want to be buying just soil. Um, the soils in on the west coast and coastal BC have very little nutrition in amongst themselves. It's very different from the prairies, and I think that's probably like I do. I do have a lot of neighbors and people here in my community who've moved here from Alberta, um, who and who don't understand why um, they can't just start gardening without a lot of nutrition added to it. And partly it's because prairie soils are not leached out the way that we don't have as much rain in the prairies and they are inherent, inherently fertile because they've just had millennia of grass growing. The, the soils on the West Coast are very different. And um, so if you are purchasing um, some kind of product to increase the fertility in your garden, um, you will not want to purchase soil. You will want to purchase uh, compost, or manure, something with fertility. Um, if you're trying to just fill a bed, then yes, that's that's what you're gonna want. And if that's the case, then you can do this type of test just to see what it is you're getting. Um, generally, you don't have a choice, but it's nice to know what you're getting. So absolutely, you can use this type of test or you can send a sample to a soil lab and they can, they can give you the analysis. Okay. Okay. And is there an ideal proportion for growing vegetables? Oh, yes. Yes, there is. So that's, I love it. My next slides, I, I, I anticipated these questions. <laughs> so um, when you have your percentages of sand, silt, and clay, um, what you can do is, and this is something you can look up on the internet, it's called a texture triangle, a soil texture triangle. And it allows you to then classify your soil um, based on, and these are already classifications that the soil science community has come up with. So um, what you can see on each side are, uh, on one side, it's your percentage of sand. Um, on, the, on the top left, it's per percentage of clay. And then the top right is percentages of silt. And for the most part, this, these don't change. Um, on, all, on all triangles, clay is on the left, silt on the right, sand on the bottom. 
Um, but always double check because who knows? Sometimes, I guess uh, I don't know. Uh, different different folks want to change it up, but this is what you know. This is how what the makeup of it is. And then what you want to do is you know based on either your your shaking um, uh, experiment or what you get from a soil lab, you will then go along one of the sides. So um, let's let's use my soil. Um, I have a 40% silt um, in on my property. So if you can see my cursor, I would want to start over here um, where it's silt 40%. And then I also have 40% clay. So what you would do is um, follow the 40 here um, until it intersects with the 40 clay. So if you can see here, 40 over, over here. So we are over kind of in this section. And um, let's see, that hasn't turned out right because I am, I am actually alone. So 40%, oh, apologies. I am not 40% clay, I'm only 20. That's why this wasn't working. See, uh, it, it, no, I'm 40% clay and 40% sand. Apologies. So I am actually a loam. Um, and loam um, soils tend to be some of the best soils for growing vegetables. Um, they've got a lot of water holding capacity. Um, they also hold a lot of nutrients well. Um, however, um, they can, like in my case, um, where we have a lot of rain in the winter months, they can flood. So you have to be really careful with that. And in the springtime, um, heavier soils, either on the loam side or heading up towards the clay side over here, um, they take a really long time to warm up in the springtime. So we often are one of the last farms to start planting where I have all of um, my farming friends in Comox who have a lot more gravelier, sandier soils that are more on this side, um, they can start planting weeks, if not months before me um, because the water drains really quickly and then their soil warms up in the springtime much better. Um, so there are pluses and minuses to all of the different types of soil textures. Um, as I mentioned before, sandier soils don't hold moisture really well. Oops, sorry, let me go back to that. Um, they, um, they drain really quickly, as I mentioned, warm up really quickly, but you are constantly having to keep watering them. So you really need a good watering system if you have a sandy soil. They're nice and deep. As I mentioned, you can grow um, carrots really well on a sandy soil, but the water is a huge issue. On the opposite side, if you have a heavier clay um, type of soil, like I did in Richmond where I, I started farming, um, again, it holds moisture really well. You almost never have to water it, but it's, it's a colder soil and you have to be really careful with um, kind of disturbing the soil when it's wet. If anyone's ever done pottery, um, with clay. I mean, this is the same material, right? Pottery clay and soil clay, same thing. And as you may know, like once you, when you, um, when you handle ha um, a high percentage of clay, you know, you get that um, very shiny sheen on, on clay. That is actually the clay compacting and, and creating that shiny surface. It's, and in pottery, it's amazing. That's what you wanna see because it hardens really nicely and you can create pottery, but you don't want to create pottery in your soil. If you are creating pottery, when it dries out, it creates this impervious layer that both moisture and roots can't break through. And so if you have a clay soil, yes, it holds moisture, it holds, um, fertilizer and fertility extremely well. Um, you know, clay soils are one of the few soils that can grow heavy feeders like cabbage and broccoli so, so well. But you have to be so careful with um, waiting until they are properly dried out before you can work with them.
So it requires a lot more patience and understanding of, of heavy soil. So I hope that answered like, um, yeah, it's nice to be in, in this area, but you know, again, pluses and minuses. I don't, I can grow good carrots that are like maybe six inches long, but past that, like I, they don't do well. I, I do have fr farming friends who can grow beautiful eight to 12 inch carrots because their s soils are so much more sandier. Um, the thing is, you once you have an idea of your soil texture, this is not really something you want to change. Um, you kind of want to live with what you have and just understand how to work with it rather than trying to bring in sand or like, I don't even think you can purchase silt, but you don't really want, like it would be incredibly expensive for you to try and change your soil texture by bringing in a material like sand. Um, it's not helpful. Sand on its own provides no nutrients. Um, if you think that you're gonna help with the drainage of your soil by adding sand, without the presence of organic matter, and we're gonna go into this in a little bit more detail later, adding sand into soil and mixing it in really only creates concrete. You know, it doesn't help the situation. Um, so I am not a big proponent of being, bringing in minerals to change the texture and the drainage in your soil. There are much better ways of doing that. Um, and I see more questions. So I hope I'm like, oh, have I, have I, have I hit a nerve with folks? Um, yeah. So one of the questions is, um, how does this all relate to potting soils and when you're growing yeah. in pots? Oh, good question. So the thing is, potting mixes have no mineral content. They are what we call soil less soil dash less, soilless mixtures. Um, there's no so actual soil in them. Um, they're primarily here in Canada, peat based. Um, and then they have perlite and vermiculite added into them. And there's a reason for that. Um, one of it is um, just the heaviness of soil, putting actual ground garden soil into pots. If you've ever tried it, your pot is incredibly heavy. And then the next thing is pots, um, especially if they're on your balcony or they're somewhere warm, when they dry out, you know, um, they do dry out. They, they have a, a very um, limited amount of soil in them that after a, a certain period of time, if you don't keep watering, the soil dries out. And um, peat moss can withstand that wet and dry um, cycle over and over again, um, quite a lot. Soil, like garden soil, when it dries out, especially if it's got any amount of clay in it, um, you will get a hard, hard clump in it. And it just does not perform well in containers. So this is why um, the industry has moved primarily to peat-based, although now we're starting to see a little bit more coconut coir, but there's no actual soil in a potting mix. Okay, so should you, can you be adding potting soil to your garden beds? Is there any benefit to that? Um, I, I, like, I like where you're going because um, potting soil is basically carbon-based. It's peat moss but it's expensive. Um, like I, and I buy um, bales of, of um, potting mix. For my farm, um, we use about 20 bales of potting mix a year. I know one of those bales is about $70. And to put it onto my, my soil, again, really, really expensive. So there are better ways. And, and we'll talk about what that is. Um, but your, your thought, um, the way that the direction you're going is, is exactly right. To improve your soil, whether it's sandy or clay, or it doesn't hold moisture, doesn't hold nutrients, the answer really lies in the organic matter and adding that instead of trying to add mineral content. Yeah. Okay. So I think last question on this topic, yeah. um, can you just do another example of how to figure out your soil on the chart? Sure. Absolutely. So, and sorry, I, I flubbed it with mine. Let's go back to like what this one was. I think we had, I'm um, calculating 60% sand, 15 silt and 25 clay. 
right? That equals 100, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so let's do it on the, the texture. So we had sand at about 60, 60%, okay? And then, and because this triangle doesn't do like 65, 15, let's go with, I think we said 20% clay. So if you can see my cursor, 60% sand here. And then where is 20% clay? It's over here, right? So where those two intersect. So you really only need two numbers when you're doing this. Um, it will automatically kind of figure out what the third one is. So you're between a sandy loam and a sandy clay loam, if, if you can see where those two intersect. Um, and that's giving you, and probably because um, the silt content is a little bit higher than the clay content, I would say you are probably more in this, in this sandy loam area. So that's how you kind of figure out the name of what you've got um, and understand that on this side, high sand, on this side, high clay, and on this side, high silt. So that's your texture over here. Um, if anyone wants to, if anyone knows their soil texture and wants us to figure it out right now, you can also put it into the chat and we can do another calculation um, based on if you've got numbers. And I don't mind coming scrolling back to this if, if you want to have a, a figure out. I hope that answered how to do that, that um, calculation. So choose one of the sides. So we did the, you know, that side. Um, for a sandy loam. And if it had just been 40% sand, like it had been a lot less. So let's say 40% sand and um, let's let's pick a number, 20% um, silt. So where's my cursor? 40% sand and 20% silt is over here. Can you see that? So this silt is over here. And so you would have been a, between a clay and a clay loam. So I hope that that answers. You can play around with it. Just follow follow the lines. The lines generally intersect. Um, you only need you start with one of the numbers, and then with the second one, you you look at where that line intersects, and and they all have an intersection. So. Yeah, and the third number, obviously, you don't necessarily have to plug in because just because of math, it it automatically assumes that the, the rest of the percentage to 100 is the, the third number. Okay, are we good to go, Kendra? I think we are. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, what this exercise is is for you is... A, it enables you just to understand, you know, the percentages of what makes up the mineral content of your soil. And that's primarily telling you the water holding capacity um, and the drainage, kind of the physical side of, of things. Um, there are other aspects, though, to your soil. And the big one, we, we kind of alluded to this already, is the organic matter and the biology in your soil. And this is really where... Um, the health of your soil comes and shines through. So when we talk about organic matter, what makes up that chocolatey brownish color in your soil? It can come from plant residues and that's both above ground, like leaf matter, like leaves dropping from the trees of, on your property, um, you know, grass that, that dies back and comes, comes forward. And it's also the roots um, of your plants that if you're growing a lot of flowers and vegetables, um, any of the root material that's left in the soil and is allowed to decompose, that um, can also, will also add to the organic matter. It can come from you purchasing or making your own compost. And I do have a few slides at the end talking about how to do this. So don't worry, we're gonna to get to how to make compost, but adding compost um, is another infusion of primarily organic matter into your soil. Manure is a, another great source of both um, organic matter and nutrients as well. Um, manure generally has up to 6% nitrogen if you're just you know, generally using um, steer or cow manure. Um, usually it has a good amount of phosphorus. Um, so those two are the major um, um, ingredients required in, in soil fertility. Um, 
yeah, there, those are your macro ingredients, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, mulches. So a mulch is any material that's placed on the surface of the soil. And it can be used for primarily two reasons, um, to um, prevent evaporation from happening in your soil, um, and also to um, prevent weeds from coming up and kind of creating havoc in, in your garden. So that's generally why a lot of people use mulches. Um, but they, if they are organic based, and not all of them are, we, we do have a number of plastic mulches that we use on our farm and lift up at the end of season. Um, they don't obviously provide any organic matter, but in our, um, a mulch like straw or hay or even coffee grounds, um, that is organic matter that's coming into the soil and helping to build um, the amount of carbon in, in organic matter. So well, we, we skipped up. Any questions about um, sources of organic matter for your soil? I didn't mention like oh, another great mulch is leaves. Um, putting, keeping the leaves on your garden, or if you, if any, if you know anything about me, I would have been like when I lived in the Lower Mainland. Um, I was the one who went around in the fall. And when people had raked up their leaves nicely and put them in bags, I would be grabbing everybody's bags um, because the leaves are such a great resource in the garden um, as a mulch. They don't have any weeds on them. They help you know, keep moisture in. Um, so they're such a great um, ingredient to add to your garden. I would go to Starbucks all the time and grab their coffee grounds because most, most coffee um, places do uh, provide coffee grounds for free for gardeners. And I see questions coming up a lot. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll just pause there. And if folks have ideas or questions about types of organic matter or, or anything else that we've covered so far. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So how do you feel about mushroom manure? Is it really mm -hmm. a manure? Oh, so such a good, interesting question, right? Um, yeah, because we think of, of chicken manure and horse manure and cow manure, we know that it's come from the backside of, of one of those animals, right? Mushroom manure does not. Um, it is generally, um, so in the lower mainland, it's generally chicken manure that's been composted first to destroy all of the um, current microbes that live in the soil, because mushrooms need to have a fairly sterile medium to grow on. They need the nutrients, but um, you know you can't have other microorganisms growing along with mushrooms, especially the edible ones. You only want your edible mushroom to survive. So it's a sterilized, um, generally chicken manure that has now um, grown a crop of mushrooms. Um, mushrooms are not a generally like a heavy feeding plant. So um, mushroom compost will still have nutrients left in it. Um, so there's some pros and cons to it. And I've, I have used, um, you know, quantity of, of mushroom manure when I farmed in the lower mainland. The nice thing about it is because it goes through that sterilization process before mushrooms are grown in it, um, it's generally weed free. Like you don't have weeds coming up the way that you can if you use like if you go to a, um, a horse farm and, and just shovel horse manure, there are some interesting grasses and things that will come up in your garden because um, you know uh, the it hasn't been sterilized. The the thing is, it, it does have a um, you know mushroom manure does have a good amount of nutrients still, especially for growing your you know just your your regular vegetables. Um, the only thing sometimes I found um, certain farms, I mean it depends how you're getting it. If it's bagged, it'll be nice and clean. I did have a load of very low cost mushroom manure that had all kinds of garbage in it that I had to take out myself, including like latex gloves and all kinds of things. So just be careful about where you're sourcing it from, I guess is, is, is my um, comment. But yeah, it is, a, it is a nice source of both fertility and organic matter for a home gardener. Okay, um, a couple people have this question. Should mulch and leaves be removed in the spring? um to prevent mm. wood bugs and slugs yeah that's the only thing right those those two are the the big issue in the springtime when um we want our either our seedlings um, or our seeds to be sprouting so um on certain crops i leave the mulch year-round um on garlic or any kind of perennial around any trees um anything that's like a, a fairly tough kind of plant i leave the mulch there um, most ornamentals as well, um, except hostas, because they do get decimated by slugs. Um, 
if you do have like young seedlings that you're transplanting, or if you're direct seeding, like at this time of the year, it's going to be pea time, you will probably want to just um, you know, rake away or create some space between your seedling and the edge of the mulch, just to give your, your seeds some time to grow above the line where they can really get attacked by wood bugs and, and slugs. So yeah, I do in the springtime recommend pulling back mulch in order to give those susceptible seedlings some time to outgrow. But then, you know, there comes a time usually in June when, you know, it starts to get really warm that you want that mulch back in order to help um, keep soil moisture in and to keep the weeds from, from popping up everywhere. So I don't get rid of it entirely. I just um, pull it back either with a rake or you know, however you want to do it and provide a space so that like, especially for slugs, I find that if they have to crawl over anything hot and dry that exposes them to um, birds and, and you, that they're less likely to want to, to attack your seedlings. But um, you know, at a certain time, yeah, slugs are kind of everywhere and it's often time that you have to go out at night and hunt for them, um, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about cover crops? Mm, well, we'll talk about cover crops in a bit, but that is another fantastic way of including um, organic matter into your soil. Um, for those who don't haven't heard that term before, a cover crop is um, something that you seed in your garden that you're not really going to harvest much from. You're primarily growing it to add carbon and add plant residue um, to absorb maybe some of the nutrients that are left over. Some cover crops like um, fall rye um, or fall oats are fantastic at doing that. So if you have leftover nutrients that you don't want to wash away through the winter months, those two crops particularly are great. Um, some of the cover crops are nitrogen fixing like peas or vetch, and they can actually add nutrients to the soil. Um, so they are, you generally do this in the fall once your, your garden is done, or there are some cover crops that you can put down in the summer months that are quick and grow really quickly and just are taking up, um, providing a weed barrier, basically um, competing with the weeds, and then you turn them under when you want to plant again. And those crops could be things like buckwheat or phacelia. Um, and that's maybe one that most people haven't heard of. Phacelia is a, um, is a purple, fantastic um, looking uh, cover crop. Crimson clover is also a, a nice summer cover crop as well. So they're generally two, two camps for cover crops, and they are also really fantastic at adding organic matter into the soil. Yeah, great. Um, are grass cuttings good for mulch? Absolutely. And, you know, just, and don't worry about like grass, because most people cut grass before it flowers, right? So grass, grass clippings are fantastic mulch. Um, I use a ton of them all the time. In fact, last summer, when we had that extended drought, um, where I had, what, 12 weeks of not no rain uh, at my place, I had about a foot of grass clippings that had accumulated over time um, over the summer months. And I, I only watered twice when once when I when I transplanted my crops into that into that field and then you know a week later one more time. And then that was it. The rest, I mean it was really the grass clippings keeping the moisture in. Um, nothing seeded out of the grass clippings. So if you have access to grass clippings um, and you know what went into them, my only worry about um, grabbing other people's grass clippings, it's something that I didn't do, is that there are still gardeners out there that use um, either themselves a weed and feed service or, you know, pay for that. And, you know, the feed side of things, you know, usually it's a chemical fertilizer that's, that's added, but it's really the weed side of it that you have to worry about because that is a herbicide um, that is often applied at the same time to prevent non-grass um, species from germinating and growing. And that's mostly what my garden is. So just be careful, you know, if it's your own grass clippings, absolutely, and you know what went into them, but um, just be aware not to use grass clippings that have had food and feed exposed to them. Okay, that kind of leads into the next question. When you're mm -hmm. taking leaves from all your neighbors, yes. um, what if the leaves, is there a risk of, you know, disease, um, yeah, eggs exactly. of, of bugs yep. you don't necessarily yep. want, that kind of thing? Yeah. So um, the nice thing is that many few people actually spray their their um, you know their trees. A, they're too big, and B, like there's generally there, it's just not done. So there's very little risk of that. Um, you know, last year we saw a lot of um, powdery mildew showing up, especially on maple trees um, and the large leaf plants. The nice thing about powdery mildew is that it does not survive on um, on tissue that's not living. So um, the fact that it's off, off of leaves, which are, are generally dead, it's not going to continue living. And the other nice thing about leaf diseases from trees is that they're generally very, very specific to that species of, of plant. So a powdery mildew from a maple tree will not create powdery mildew on a pea. 
because we know peas are also susceptible to powdery mildew or to squash and pumpkins. It's a totally different species of fungus that in, in, infects um, the cucum cucumber, cucurbit family, squash and, and, um, and pumpkin, then the species of fungus that creates powdery mildew in, in maple trees. So no, there's no worry that way um, between tree, you know, um, what you're seeing on, on tree leaves and your vegetable or flower garden. So okay. yeah. Um, is cedar tree litter okay for mulching? Yeah, you know, um, uh, the short answer is yes. You can use cedar um, tree mulch in, in your garden. Um, with any type of woody material, the important part is to not bury that material into the soil. So um, like, unlike, I guess, straw and um, say coffee grounds, that's that generally is light and kind of sits on the surface of the soil anyways. And over time, um, it does break down. Uh, cedar tree and any, I, I, you know, any tree, if you've got shredded tree, tree bits that have been, uh, that you've been shredding on your property or have been um, gifted to you, um, that material should stay on the surface of the soil. Um, so, because if it does get buried into the soil, it will start to compost and it will draw nutrients from the soil into the composting process because it's just so high in carbon. Um, so that's the only thing you have to be um, just a little bit careful of is not doing any kind of rototilling or any kind of burying of woody debris into your soil. Now, as the wood breaks down, it will attract a lot of wood bugs. So in general, I see most gardeners put like cedar or fir um, types of, of sawdust down in their pathways um, rather than on the beds themselves, just because of that wood bug issue. Um, you know, when a lot of seedlings are young, like um, tomato, pepper, uh, Sadly, uh, wood bugs love chewing on them. So um, once they're older, wood bugs tend to not really um, go after them. But young plants are pretty susceptible to wood bugs. So that's just the one thing to, to worry about. And interestingly, you know, most people know cedar as um, a tree that really doesn't, that is long lasting, that doesn't rot. Um, and they think that it's not safe to use in your garden. But, you know, talking to some of the other gardening experts and farming experts in this area that have tried, um, they've successfully grown like even squash in a mulch of cedar um, and, and it's doable and they didn't see any any type of um, uh, negative impact of, of, you know, you think of cedar as being a really oily tree, but uh, it didn't seem to impact. So if that's what you've got, then yeah, use it. Okay. Um, are vegetable peels and mm -hmm. other, you know, fruit peels a good mulch? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing physically wrong with using peels um, or any type of wood, woody debris on the top of your soil. Um, the only thing is that it can be a bit of an attractant to, um, raccoons, other rodents, that kind of thing, which is why generally they're composted first before they're put it out into the garden so that they're transformed into something that looks more like what's in this photo than the actual peel itself. But I mean, if that's not a worry for you, then you can absolutely just put those things right into the garden. In fact, orange peels are have been known to deter cats. So if you have a neighbor cat that likes to dig in your garden, orange peels are, are supposedly like that oil, the orange oil is something the cats don't really like. So yeah. Interesting. I know in West Vancouver um, and probably where you are too, you know, bears are a big concern. So yeah. putting yeah. out your peels and any food. Uncomposted. It's, it's yeah, yeah. really so encourages you, those bears to come yeah. to your property. Just be aware. Yeah. yeah. Um, should you be putting tomato plants in with your compost? Ooh, good question. So, oh, I love all these questions. <laughs> the The worry with tomato plants, if, if you've only um, had something like powdery mildew that we mentioned before, that doesn't survive on um, dead debris, you're fine. If, however, you have had any symptoms of late blight, which is a very common disease on tomatoes, it um, that's what caused like it it moves between tomatoes and potatoes. That's what caused um, the Irish potato famine. 
it will live on dead tissue. And so it's not something that should be composted at home. You should send that out with your municipal compost instead. So just be aware that of what diseases have shown up um, on your plants. Like I would say last year when we had that extremely warm and dry fall, the occurrence of, of late blight would have probably been incredibly minimal and you would have been safe to put your tomatoes into your compost. But if we do get a wet fall um, where late blight shows up, it's probably best to you know send that out to municipal compost. And that segues right into the next question. Is that municipal compost a good source for your garden? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, mostly it's, you know, vegetable compost and um, woody debris, uh, like, you know, trimmings that either services or, or home gardeners have sent to, to be composted. So it's, again, um, most uh, municipal composting systems do what's called a hot compost, and we'll talk about what that is, which generally kills off any weed seeds or any of your, like, I've, I do a cold composting system and I generally get like volunteer tomatoes and melons and squash, all kinds of things popping up in my own home compost. You generally don't get that in the municipal compost. So it's nice. The only negative I would say, and this happens in my own garden compost, is sometimes those vegetable stickers show up, right? And you just you just have to pick those out. But it happens in my own compost because we often miss some of those labels on our orange peels and, and the outside of the banana peels. So sometimes that, that can show up. But I haven't seen any kind of negative coming out of the compost. And just if you are going to purchase compost, um, make sure that it is the vegetable and kitchen scrap compost, not the biosolid compost. Because some in some regions do sell, you know, that that type of compost, which is um, what's come out of the sewage treatment system. So it's human sewage, which has been hot composted. There's no, you know, microbes or anything like that. But I I am generally not um, recommending people put that on their food growing areas. It's okay for ornamental areas, but I, yeah, not, not on your food growing areas, but kitchen compost, um, you know, they're two different streams that is perfectly safe to put in your garden. Great. Um, I think we're good on this topic for now. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, great questions, everyone. So thank you for, for bringing those up. Okay. So why we're going to now talk about air pockets, because, you know, if you go back to that slide where we had all of the components of your soil, we had the mineral com component, the organic matter and biology, and then we had air. Right. And I just want to stress how important air is in your soil. So one of the main reasons you want air is that soil at plant roots need air around them. They actually do um, respire. They need to be able to take up oxygen. And so those air pockets are really important for that reason. The other reason is that air, having air pockets means that your soil has drained and the roots are not sitting in water. So when your plant roots do sit in water, that's where you can often have the occurrence of diseases happening. Um, your, the roots just aren't able to survive. Um, they're in an anaerobic environment. They often die off. And so those air pockets are incredibly important um, for the plants to survive. So you can have a soil that's more like a brick that has very little air pockets in it. Um, it has what's called a high bulk density. And that may be a terminology that if you ever get your soil tested, it might come up. High bulk density is not a good thing. What you want is more of a sponge type of soil, something that does have lots of air pockets for your plant roots to grow and for oxygen um, to be able to not just support your plants, but also the, the biology of your soil. You know, a lot of the beneficial bacteria and, um, and fungi do need that oxygen too. So, you know, you want to have a high pore space um, just so that roots can penetrate, water can drain. Those are the two main reasons why, why air pockets are so important. So when you look at um, soil structure, having a lot of air pockets, like having big particles that drain, that have a lot of air pockets around them, allow plants to really fill that space with their roots and grow. When those air pockets are minimized, um, either from the texture of the soil itself, like what we've talked about, having a high amount of clay um, where the particles are teeny teeny and there's not a lot of air around them, or because um, the soil has been worked wet um, for an, a number of years, can cause on the right side of this slide, can cause crusts to form at different layers which makes it really hard for roots to penetrate. And it also makes it really difficult for water to make its way deep into the soil. 
So what you want to see more is what's here on the left, a nice, airy, friable soil. Now, the thing is, um, what most gardeners do to try and create this like airy soil is to rototill, you know, their, their garden to kind of what they think is break up the soil and infuse a lot of oxygen in them, in the soil. What tends to happen though, is that most rototillers are working at like a 12 inch depth, you know, and they're constantly, you're going 12 inch, 12 inch, 12 inch. At the level where the blade of the rototiller hits the soil, you start to actually create a crusted layer. And you can actually cause what's called a hard pan, P-A-N, a hard pan by working your soil, especially when it's too wet, at a consistent level all the time. Um, so you think that you're creating a nice, fluffy, high um, porosity soil, but it's only doing so at one level and creating a crust lower down. So this is one of the reasons why um, we're starting to recommend more of a what's called a no-till gardening system, where um, you, you only till when you absolutely need to with a rototiller and try and do a, a lot more work using a fork just to break up the soil and to aerate it rather than flipping and constantly fl flipping the soil. Um, when you don't flip the soil um, a lot, what ends up happening is that the biology helps to create those air pockets for you. And the primary source of that work is earthworms. Um, earthworms hate it when you rototill your soil. First of all, they themselves get rototilled into shreds. And so you destroy a lot of earthworms in the layers that you, you rototill. And the disturbance is really hard on them. So by, by doing less of that type of disturbance, you're giving um, the, the um, soil biology a chance to create those air pockets and those furrows more naturally. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of revealing a little bit about myself. I'm a pretty lazy gardener and farmer. If I don't have to do a lot of heavy duty work, I, I don't want to. So wherever possible, I try and do a no-till system um, of just only lightly forking if I have to, um, but not disturbing the soil. I think the only time that we really have to do a soil disturbance if, is the initial year. Like if we are converting um, a field that is in hay or grass into a vegetable field that first year, we may rototill, especially if we haven't had time to come in and, and put down sheet mulch material. But that's kind of the only time that we bring out the tractor to do a big rototill so that the rest of the time we're, we're using other techniques so that we maintain this good soil structure. I'm going to pause there because I know I've kind of probably um, did some folks or like caused a bit of like, oh, so um, questions. Yeah. So what do you do when your soil is compacted and how do you improve yeah, those yeah. air pockets? So um, there's a couple of ways that you can improve. Um, again, I'm going to come back to organic matter. Not only is it fantastic for that sandy soil and absorbing um, good amounts of, of moisture in a heavier soil, like a clay soil or like a loam soil where I am, adding layers of organic matter to the top of the soil um, is a great way of just increasing the porosity. So things like grass clippings and straw and, and coffee grounds and compost, they eventually do get incorporated into the soil. Has anyone ever seen when earthworms come up and, and create castings on the surface of the soil? It's happening right about now at this time of the year. I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so basically what they're doing is they're pulling a lot of the organic matter that naturally falls to the surface of the soil and they're bringing it down and they're consuming it and then they're pooping it up at the top. So they're creating all of these kinds of tunnels in the soil by mixing the stuff that's on the top. They're bringing it down, eating it, coming back, pooping, grabbing more material. And so they're doing a natural type of rototilling. And the more organic matter and organic material you have, the more type of of microbes that will do this work for you. So that's one, is increase the amount of organic matter that you have in your soil. The second one is to try and protect your soil over the winter months so that it doesn't compact and you don't have to bring out the rototiller. And so the mulch is another th another reason why you want to mulch is that it 
it absorbs those heavy, heavy raindrops instead of the rain falling directly onto your soil and compacting it. Um, and that happens like on the West Coast, it's incredible the amount of force that rain has on the surface of the soil. And it just over the months, you know, over time, it just creates its constant bashing of your soil. Putting a layer of, of mulch absorbs that high impact and allows the water to just slowly then trickle into the soil. So it helps maintain those air pockets as well. And then, you know, come springtime, if you do feel that you're like, especially if you're planting something like carrots um, or any kind of vegetable that needs a really fine um, sort of structure to the soil, um, instead of putting a rototiller in um, a garden fork or a broad fork, um, putting it into the soil, uh, wiggling it, but not flipping um, as much as you can, try not to disturb the soil. Um, you can obviously the first um, inch or so, if you've got weeds growing that you can hoe off or weed off, but try not to flip this, this, um, this area as much as possible. Man. So those would be, you know, a few techniques to use. So do all these same rules apply in raised garden beds and, you know, contained garden planters? You know, yeah, I mean, over time, um, like a raised garden bed in the first few years, you'll notice, notice it's a very fluffy um, environment. In fact, you probably need to water a lot, a lot, because, you know, if as you've put in material, you've added a lot of oxygen. Over time, though, I find that the material in garden beds and in, in larger pots settles, and you do want to work that like you want to um, lessen the amount that you're standing in the bed or rototilling into the bed. Um, better to just add layers of of organic material on the top rather than try and get in there and, and do rototilling. So yeah, it's a little bit different. It all depends on what material went into your, your raised bed. But I would say over time, those beds also do start to compact. And so um, trying, you know, not to walk on, on them as we try not to walk on most of our garden beds and maintain that, that porosity. So yeah, it, it's still important even in, in raised beds. Okay. Um, so when your garden borders a forest, mm -hmm. in this case, a cedar forest, which we have a few of around here, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, your garden is full of tree roots. Um, should that be tilled? What, oh. any, any tricks? You know, that's, that's a hard one because uh, it's amazing the amount of nutrients and moisture that cedar roots will pull out of your garden. And I've had folks struggle and fight with those cedar roots. And I can tell you, I mean, it's not sad. It's a great thing that our cedar trees are surviving. They will win. Um, it's an amazing root system that will outcompete your poor vegetables anytime. So if that is the, the issue in your garden, you may want to consider a raised bed. But, and I don't normally recommend having a raised bed with a bottom on it, but in this situation to prevent those cedar roots from coming up into your garden boxes, and they will, um, having some kind of either plastic bottom um, or some kind of solid bottom. And then that requires you to have quite a high raised bed, like six inches of soil is not enough to grow most vegetables, maybe some salad greens, but that's about it. Like you will want to have at least eight inches, 12, and if you can, two feet. Um, but that's just the, the one struggle. If that's the only place your garden can go on the edge of the forest where the tree roots are coming from, yeah, you just want to create all beds and then have cedar roots make their way in. You just, it's not a winning game there. So that's um, yeah, containers um, with, a, with solid bottoms is probably the way to go. So similarly, if you're bordering um, black walnut trees, should that not be oh, in your evidence? Yeah, the walnut is the one tree, sadly, that you don't want to get. Um, black walnut gives off a substance called dugulone that is a natural plant inhibitor. So you want to not be in the tree, like the drip line of the tree, like where the, the leaves naturally fall, because both the leaves and the roots exude jugulone. So if you are going to out to collect plant leaves, don't collect um, black walnut, as another um, note. So be a far enough away that you don't have that impact happening on your plants. So yeah, good question. Okay. Great. Um, and if you want to add worms to help mm. aerate your soil, yeah. um, where can you get them? And is there a best time of year to add them? Mm. Well, I think you would probably want to, well, a couple ways you can do eight best ways to start creating your own compost because worms naturally just appear. And, and then as you put that compost into your room, not only are you accepting all your nutrients, but you're adding the worms too. If that's not all of you, or if it's going to take you a bit of time, um, if you know it's farms, um, horse manure is one of the few manures that are appear, like the proper carbon hydrogen ratio, 25 to one, that it composts incredibly quickly and just kind of appear. 
um, and especially the regular worms. So those worms love that warm, composty um, environment. You'll find a lot of worms that way. Um, now the, there's pros and cons. So those types of worms um, love like the top layer of soil where it's nice and warm. Um, it's really the earthworms that are the, the ones a little bit slower, but don't like colder, colder soil um, that is generally found in your garden. So trying to encourage those types of worms, basically you build it and they will come. So if there's no enough food for them in the soil, so a lot of organic matter, a lot of nutrients, they will just magically appear. Earthworms multiply incredibly quickly. So yeah, having the right, having a good amount of organic matter and then not compacting your soil, reducing the amount of um, disturbance, um, your your soils will naturally start to have worms appear. Um, so it, I wouldn't buy them is, is probably the best way to say that because either you can get them for free, you know, out of horse manure or through your compost, or if you just create the right environment for them, they will come. Right. Okay. I think that's it on this topic. Okay. Great. I'm glad to see so many questions. Thanks, everybody. So I hope, you know, I kind of recommended um, some of the uh, good ways of moving forward um, to manage your soil so that you're not compacting it, especially if you've got a really heavy clay soil, which is the most susceptible to compacting. Um, using less disturbance, um, increasing your, the organic matter in your soil. Another really great way of technique of increasing the amount of air pockets and organic matter is when you are finished for the gardening season, instead of pulling out the plants, roots and all, if you can slice your plants here, um, compost the top, but leave the roots in the soil. Over the winter, as they dissolve, all of these roots, once they, um, you know, compost, have these root channels will still be here. And these are fantastic little pathways for worms to move in. So that's another nice technique of how to increase the soil um, structure and, and really benefit the soil. So rather than pulling out your roots, leave them there and they will slowly decompose over the winter. So, you know, we've talked about trying to build um, healthy soil. So just some, some of, the top of the ways we've already discussed. So lots of organic matter, that's probably the key way of building healthy soil. Not working the soil when it's wet, um, especially if you've got a heavy clay soil or, you know, even a loam soil with a lot of silt, it, you have to be really careful not to work it so that you prevent um, the compaction layer, the hard pan layer, or just like, you know, the formation of pottery in, in your in your soil. Um, and you do that and just reducing tillage overall um, really helps to build a better, um, more porous soil because naturally um, the soil microbes will form proper channels and, and um, ability for, for air and moisture to move through the soil. Um, if you can, through the winter months, try not to leave your soil bare. We talked about cover cropping, planting something specifically um, to, to grow through the winter months. We talked about mulching, um, putting down either a plastic or um, a um, plant-based material. So that, you know, a tarp, if you can't, didn't get time to, to cover crop, uh, that's something that you can put onto your soil, again, just to absorb the shock and the, the impact of the raindrops through the winter months. Um, but living so living roots year round, um, especially in the winter months are, are really the best option. So if you can either cover crop or, and who doesn't want this, grow vegetables through the winter. And, you know, we live in an environment, um, sort of Southwestern BC, that you can grow um, vegetables um, through the winter months. And there's lots of great information on what those vegetables do and the timing. West Coast Seeds is a great um, resource. Their catalog has the planting calendar. So highly recommend that. And as I mentioned, mulching to maintain cool soil and protect it. So we've talked about um, cover cropping, you know, growing that sacrificial plant um, to increase the organic matter, reduce weeds, um, mulching. Here's that example of putting down some kind of material over the soil um, just to protect it from the heat of the sun, from the impact of the, the raindrops. And then here's the, you know, the type of forking that you can do. If you want, if you feel that your soil is too compacted and needs a bit of air, this is the tool that I would recommend rather than a rototiller. I will just pause now. Okay, um, are moss as good as a cover crop? Ooh, good question. I don't see why not. I mean, if the moss is just growing in your garden, yeah, let it grow. Um, it's not doing anything negative. The thing is moss does indicate um, a very low pH in your soil. 
So if you do have a lot of moss, um, it's, it usually means that your soil is quite acidic, um, that it's probably shady and may require um, some more drainage. So generally mosses don't grow in very well draining soil. Like you almost never see moss on a sandy soil, but on a heavy, on a clay or soil or where water sits for a, a while, moss can grow. But I mean, moss is great as an alternative lawn. So if that's what you have, like, yay, celebrate. I mean, it's lovely under your feet. You don't have to mow it. There's lots of benefits to that. So I'm not one that says, you know, to get rid of the moss just so that you can grow grass just so that you can keep mowing it. So yay, if that's what moss is, if moss is growing and if you don't mind it, let it grow. Um, but it is generally an indicator of, um, yeah, soil acidity, uh, low light levels. Um, yeah, so if that's if that's something that worries you, like you can, you can adjust the app, but just know that it often is an indicator of something else. Okay, and what do you do with your cover crops at the end mm -hmm. of the season? Yeah. That's another good question. So um, it, often gardeners will till under the, and I, I know this just goes against everything I just said, said to you, right? Like to disturb your soil. So um, with fall rye, that is one of the issues is how to stop the crop from growing so you can grow whatever else that you want. Um, which is one of the reasons like we generally only grow fall rye if we are wanting to harvest the grain the, the following year because it is very difficult to to kill it. So what we do is we plant cover crops that we know will either die out with frost and create a mat of, of leafy material. So for us, uh, uh, winter peas or uh, what are called um, Austrian Austrian peas, um, those generally will die out by about December because we get minus 17 where we are. But in the meantime, like from August, September, when we seed that cover crop, um, the plant is absorbing nitrogen and adding it to the soil. Um, and even, the, you know, when the cover crop dies and, you know, the vines cover the soil, that's a mulch. So that's, that's fantastic. The other cover crops like buckwheat, um, we, instead of um, rototilling it, we allow it to start flowering. But before the, the seeds set, we go in and we just weed whack it down, cut it off, let all of that leaf litter fall down to the, to the surface of the soil. And that's pretty much the buckwheat done. Um, so, you know, mowing it rather than rototilling it um, the, that's what we go after. And that would work with, um, for example, um, the crimson clover, um, because once it starts to flower, it is now in, it's not in vegetative mode anymore. It, it won't regrow. Um, same with the phacelia, um, similar method. If you did um, want to stick with like a fall rye or um, a winter, like a, an oats, um, just know that um, you can you can mow it um, fall rise a little bit tougher, you may need to mow it a few times, um, or, you know, pulling it up. Sadly, that's one of the, the only ways to, to really terminate fall rye. It's, it's a tough one to grow. So know that, you know, that is part of the, 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 the catch 22, um, growing that cover crop, but then trying to incorporate it or, um, providing that space for you to, be able to grow whatever else you wanted to grow there. Um, those are the choices that you have to make when you're deciding what cover crop to grow. Okay. And uh, what about soil chemistry? Should you be doing something about your low or high pH mm. soil? Yeah. Yeah. So um, great question. Most, it really depends on um, what you're trying to grow. Uh, if you are a vegetable gardener, most vegetables prefer to be in the pH range of about 5.5 to 6.5. So slightly acidic, um, but not overly so. Um, our soils here nat naturally have a pH of 5.2. 5 so we do have to add uh, lime every year. The ideal time to lime is actually in the fall because um, your regular calcium carbonate, just the chalk kind of lime, even the fine stuff, takes months to change pH. And if it's um, fall or winter applied, by spring, the pH will have been adjusted. Um, 
adding lime now, <clears throat> it, it will eventually change the pH, but not for the young, young seedlings. But sadly, spring is when lime is available, right? I, I see this, the bags of lime now out in, in front of many stores. So grab it when you can and apply it whenever it's available. If you can stockpile some lime for the fall, um, apply it then. Uh, the only vegetable that doesn't appreciate having lime put down is potatoes. Um, because there is a scab disease that can impact potatoes, that um, doesn't like it when the pH is too low. So scab, um, to prevent scab, you keep your soil acidic. Um, so you generally don't plant your potatoes in soil that you've just limed. It's okay if it was limed a few years ago, by now that calcium will be gone, but yeah, the, the pH is important for nutrient availability and to prevent certain diseases. Um, so adjusting it uh, uh, according to what you're gonna grow is important. Yeah. Um, on the flower side, it's not quite as important on the ornamental side. Um, certain plants like the azalea rhodos prefer more acidic pH. So adding some sulfur if your pH is, is on the high side is maybe something that you might want to consider um, depending on where you are. So that's, that's the importance of having your soil tested and knowing what pH you have. Um, that's probably one of the biggest reasons I recommend doing at least a soil test once every few years. It's the pH. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's no more cover crop specific questions. Okay. Great. And I see we only have a few minutes left. So let's skedaddle. So um, this, we're coming to the end anyways. I just wanted to talk about composting because um, we, uh, we've already mentioned a great way of introducing organic matter of also um, invigorating the biology of your soil. Um, so if, you, if you're not sure, if you haven't had a, like good success, um, often it's just the biology in your soil is, is out of whack. Um, think of your soil biology similar to what your gut biology is like. <clears throat> there, it is also, also called um, a microbiome. So by making compost, um, you are kind of creating like, it's almost like making sauerkraut or probiotics for your soil. So apart from just putting in nutrients and recycling all the stuff that comes out of your garden, it really is a great invigorator for, my, for the biology of your soil. The nice thing about making your own compost is that you know exactly what ingredients went into it. So that's another huge benefit. Um, basically, creating compost requires you to look at carbon and nitrogen layers in your soil. Most people think of like the kitchen waste, like what's in the photo as compost, but actually the most important thing is to figure out what carbon are you going to put into your compost. The carbon is that dry brownie material that will create the air pockets that are important for making an aerobic compost work properly. <clears throat> Sadly, as we all see, if you keep uh, buckets of veggie scraps around too long in your kitchen, you know they can get mushy and liquidy and create this not so nice smell. That is an, actually an indicator that you've created an anaerobic environment, just that liquid forming at the bottom of your bucket. Um, so having the brown uh, ingredients helps to, first of all, absorb all the moisture, but it creates those air pockets so that you can have a proper aerobic composting system. So I've listed some just very basic um, Brown ingredients that you know most of us may have access to. Um, leaves are probably going to be one of your biggest things, and stockpiling leaves in an urban environment highly recommend. Um, but don't overlook you know paper, especially newspaper um, and straw if you can find it. And you know what, cardboard that that's another ingredient. Oops, sorry. And in your greens, um, yeah, your your food scraps from your kitchen, manure, grass clippings, alfalfa pellets. Um, those are some of the things that you can add that have a little bit more nitrogen in them and are, they're actually there to help you break down the brown ingredients. So um, think of compost as, you know, these, this is your, these are like, if you ever have made a fire, you know, these are your large pieces of wood and the greens are like your fire starter. This is what really quickens and, and speeds up the composting process is having these things, but you wanna make sure you have enough brown because you want to have a nice, long, strong fire not something that's just green and, you know, um, burns up really quickly. Um, and if you have only greens in a compost pile, you will often have anaerobic pockets. So yeah, it's just not nice to have um, the smells that come up from just having greens. Um, so often what we'll want to do is create layers. So this is a typical composter that you can find in most urban environments. I would say the, Im the important part is the base. Um, putting a base layer of like of sticks and twigs and high carbon that will eventually absorb all of the liquids that kind of drip out from the green layers. So bottom having high carbon 
and then and maybe shredded um, paper leaf, leaves all of that thing at the bottom and then you make lasagna layers you know a green layer a brown layer a green layer in between if you have soil or finished compost from another pile you could put a thin layer in between just to inoculate um, and get the process started once you have layers like this you then have a choice depends on how strong your back is you can either do hot composting which requires a lot of turning of your composting of your compost layers mixing the layers up adding lots of oxygen um, there's some benefits, you know, when your compost pile really heats up, kills a lot of the weed seeds, kills a lot of the tomato and, and um, pumpkin seeds, um, it will kill any pathogens. It's fast. The thing is, it, it does cr create or it does require a lot of physical energy, like turning compost pile, I have to say, is one of my least favorite jobs. You can get um, compost diggers that you just plunge into the compost pile and, and it and as you pull out, it moves material from the bottom up. But that won't allow you to do a hot compost. To do a hot compost, you actually have to do a lot of flipping of material um, from one bay to another or from one bin to another. So it's fast. You get some great compost within like a month, um, but it's turning every three or four days. Whereas cold composting, which is kind of like, yeah, I do that mostly, creating the layers and then letting it sit, um, allowing the earthworms to do a lot of the work. Um, and then eventually the bottom layers are done. It requires you to take off the top layers to get to the bottom. But yeah, you end up with compost, which will have, you know, seeds of pumpkins and tomatoes and all kinds of things come up in. But um, yeah, if you don't mind that, it's it's a much easier way of doing it. So really depends on um, your ability to turn and your your time availability as well. Um, yeah, pros and cons to both, and and both are great. I think composting is just something everybody should be doing. Um, even when I lived in an urban environment, I never gave my veggie scraps to the municipality. This that was gold, man. <laughs>